So I'm just going to talk about uh, using MRI to evaluate the uh, ascending aorta and <coughs> to a less extent the AV and, and the relevance is of course what we're doing with the TAVI is trying to um, fix the flow uh, and to prevent uh, future complications. Um, the uh, title refers to a, a large project we're running called Beyond the Tape Measure which is uh, basically saying uh, measuring geometry um, and simple um, uh, flow metrics is probably not covering, um, covering the risk, uh, des describing the pathophysiology um, uh, which occurs um, in abnormal flow situations that cause dissections and further dilatation. Um, so as a result of that, our ability to predict events uh, is fairly poor. So we're never quite sure, um, say, of Richmond's patients, which of those will go on to have dissections, which will go on to um, further dilate. Um, and I think the same is true of our uh, post-procedural patients. Um, I don't think we have a very good predictive power for, for knowing how it's going. So my particular interest is 4D flow. 4D flow is a, a technique that's been around for a while, uh, but in my view has only been clinically practical for the last uh, three or four years. Um, <coughs> it's a beautiful data set. You can get the entire data set in about nine minutes of free breathing. Uh, it's actually a lot easier than conventional MRI to acquire. Um, and it gives you ability to retrospectively analyse the entire flow patterns in the aorta and around the valve. Um, <coughs> and um, it's really the, a complete vector description of the entire flow. But it is hard, and the reason it's hard is because that data set is massive, about six gigabytes in most patients. Um, and, but it is getting easier, and that's been the subject of a lot of my work. So here's a picture on the left. You can see blue dots which represent uh, the different images we've obtained um, uh, during the cardiac cycle. And on the right, uh, that's some fairly basic processing generating vectors from those. Um, and that's when the work begins from my perspective. So all these uh, measurements uh, and descriptions on the right are the sorts of things we can target. And I think you'll agree these are all things that are relevant uh, to survival, um, to um, performance of any device that you wanted to put in or any native valve. One of the particularly interesting things uh, that we've been working on hard is pathline analysis. And the reason that's important um, is it gives us a way to numerically understand what's going on. So the example in the aortic valve would be tracking, for instance, uh, the, the flow of blood particles, so to speak, as they curl up and uh, cause uh, leaflet closure and opening. Um, on the bottom you can see filling in the right atrium and we've simply tagged inflowing blood uh, blue, uh, green and red with successive heartbeats and you can see we can actually track uh, with exquisite detail what goes on inside um, the atrium which is quite a complicated structure. Um, so in my clinical work um, I do a lot of um, aortic imaging um, I now use uh, a framework uh, by, by a company called Arteris that I collaborate with and that gives us quite nice qualitative and simple quantitative data in, in real time more or less um, and it allows me to use that data to report on <coughs> the clinical setting. Um, numerically in the lab uh, we use our own software which we've developed a lot. Um, and that's going to allow us over time to use much more targeted specific um, metrics um, that uh, can give us a lot more information. So here's an example. This is a, a, a picture from a patient with some central AR and you can see the uh, jet of AR in the bottom left hand frame um, and quite disturbed flow, if I can find my mouse, uh, here in the ascending aorta. Here's another case um, just showing how we can visualise flow. So this is just intensity, uh, higher, in, higher intensity in red being higher velocity flow. So you can see we get a very, very good depiction of what's going on. This chap's got uh, a dissection in the descending aorta and that's thrombus on the side with no flow in it. Here's a patient uh, who's had a valve replacement. Uh, so we do get local signal loss, but it's surprisingly little uh, and in fact we can analyse quite close to the valve, we can go right up to about five millimetres to a centimetre, it just depends on the device and the amount of metal. 
So I th thought I'd just rip through a few cases just to sort of give you a feel for how we can uh, evaluate patients live and, and, and what it all means. So I'd emphasise at this point, uh, I, I pretty much use 4D flow uh, in my formal clinical report uh, just as a descriptive technique. Um, really, it's not much help to anyone um, to tell them there's heavily disturbed flow in the ascending aorta because we don't really have metrics for that. We don't know what that means in terms of outcome. Um, and as you know, uh, cardiology is, is all about the numbers. So this patient's got a dilated ascending aorta, a dilated root, and an effaced sinotubular junction, and the flow is terrible. So here's uh, an axial view at the level of the bifurcation of the ascending aorta, and you can see there's basically a yin-yang sign going on. There's not much forward flow going on. It's equally sideways and circular. Um, this same patient's got a dilated left subclavian artery, and you can see there's all sorts of dynamics going on, in, including flow reversal up that vessel. Uh, so stagnant flow reversing up the sub, left subclavian um, probably puts this person at a pretty high stroke risk. So that's someone with, uh, you know, lots of things going wrong. Here's another case. Um, it's a bicuspid a um, AV, you can see that there. Um, there, there is a dilated aortic root and a moderately dilated ascending aorta. I think it was about 46 or 7 millimetres. Um, and, and again, there's terrible flow. Um, and so that's clearly driven by a couple of things, by his valve, uh, by the regurgs to some extent, and by the um, uh, dilatation. And it's quite a job to actually untangle what's causing what. Not sure if we've kicked on. Oh yeah, this is another patient. So another case here. Um, in this case, uh, the um, effacement's quite severe. Uh, and again, really terrible flow in here. And we know that affects um, efficiency, it affects uh, wall shear numbers, and I can show you that in a second. And that's what it should, like in a, should look like in a normal person. And I'm here I'm just showing um, the sort of waveform we can generate. We've drawn a circle here around the AV and we can measure the flow very accurately. Um, and this works very well. And um, I think in the next slide, the same person. You can see that's what flow should look like. So this is laminar flow here where you've got high flow in the centre and it tails off to the sides. Very, very different picture. <coughs> So in terms of advanced metrics, uh, this isn't in the clinic yet. This isn't something I'd, I'd uh, report on for a patient. But these are data generated in my lab, uh, measuring wall shear direct from the, um, the 4D flow data. We've just published the first proper description of wall shear stress in a normal population, 250 people. Um, and it's the first time that measured wall shear stress, as in measured from data, um, is close to the numbers that you should get, that we know you should get from simulations. So no one's actually ever really measured directly what wall shear stress is in a decent sized population. Um, and this is the sort of depiction I like. I think this is the sort of picture that has got clinical um, utility where we can actually just map out where the regions of high and low wall shear are uh, across the cycle. So here we've slit open the aorta along its length, we've unwrapped it, and we've laid it out with the valve at the top and the uh, diaphragmatic uh, portion of the aorta at the bottom. Another thing we're doing with 4D flow here, so these are uh, four different um, prosthetic valves. So a bioleaflet, a bioprosthesis and a monoleaflet. Uh, I didn't have a TAVI to show you. Um, the, these uh, coloured pictures depict uh, fluid shear strain and on the bottom vorticity, so both reflecting um, the degree of um, abnormal uh, flow. And you can see this is the sort of profile you might expect in a healthy person. So it's a nice smooth profile with a peak at systole. Um, this is a log scale. Um, the bioprosthesis, you can see there's a really prolonged high, high um, uh, fluid shear strain region and high vorticity, very, very, very abnormal flow. So, you know, I think this is uh, potentially very valuable in terms of assessing actually the outcome uh, at a fluid dynamics level of your um, interventions. And just another picture of um, the wall shear numbers. So, might just end there. I think I'm on time. Mm -hmm.